So I'm Rob Conybeer with Shasta Ventures, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Des Trainer. Des Trainer is a Jedi master of product. And for those of you that may not be familiar with Des, Des is a regular speaker on product management, product strategy. He was a longtime consultant around this, and then he went over and actually put a lot of what he preached into practice as a co-founder of Intercom. Intercom Software, where he's a chief strategy officer, is a leading provider that's raised over $100 million to build software that connects enterprises directly with their customers and really removes all the impediments to do that. So one of the things to kick this off that I want to point out is Des, when he talks about product, he often talks about the death of products the end of products, that your product is obsolete before you even know it. But Des, would love to move to the beginning, the, the nascent stages of a product. And what are the important things that entrepreneurs or people need to think about when they're really laying the foundation for a product? One of the reasons I, I'm interested in death is kind of a uh, it's because it's a part of life. And uh, you know, in a sense, starting a product is going to sow the seeds of the death of another product if you're successful. Like people will only start using your product if they stop doing something else. And uh, it's kind of like that semi-sonic song, you know, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's <laughs> end. Uh, it's, it's that sort of idea. So I think like, there is so much that goes into this sort of the genesis of a product idea. But the first thing I always encourage people to focus on is basically the actual problem they're, that they're trying to solve. Like, what is the specific job that the customer they're trying to uh, build for is trying to do in their life? And I think like that's very much a sort of a, a new. I mean, it, it should have been persistent forever. But I think we had a lot of like technology for startups, which was something like, "Hey, given that this thing is possible, let's see if we can make a product out of it." And we had like sales first startups, which is like, "Hey, given that I sold this shit, let's go and build it." And we had like maybe marketing or buzz first startups, which is, "Hey, we've got a lot of attention for this thing. Let's see if it's possible." I think like what we're seeing in product first startups is this obsession over solving the problem for the user. So whenever I talk to early stage founders who are kind of still nurturing their idea. That's usually where I encourage them to focus heavily. Is just like let's obsess about the exact. But before we get into like the founding, the team, the the style of work, the frameworks, the methodologies, let's really obsess over this problem and how are we going to know as much about it as possible. So when you go through and do that, what do you advise people to do in order to get that information? Is it to talk to users, or is it more about trying to understand the user and make some base assumptions because sometimes users don't know what they actually want. Right. Uh, <clears throat> The first thing I'd say is, I think everyone is always better equipped to solve a problem that they have some experience of themselves. It's kind of like having user research on tap. So, so if you're really, really, uh, you can compensate for this by having a fantastic research team and doing a lot of like, you know, frankly, like social studies, watching how people interact with all of this sort of stuff. You can overcome it, but if you can experience a problem directly yourself, and for sure, we built Intercom as a solution to our own problem. We couldn't talk to our users. Um, if you can experience it yourself, that's better. But to your second point, which I think is, is just as important, um, does, there is that famous Henry Ford quote that I kind of hate, which is like, if I had have asked the customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And the reason I hate that quote is because he didn't ask the customers what they wanted. But even if he did, uh, uh, they would have said a faster horse, which means that you, as the product designer, hear that and you say, OK, so speed is an important requirement in a solution here. What else is important? And they might say things like, well, you know, when I try to cross the state with my horse, it takes five days, and I get really wet and cold. You're like, OK, so you don't insulation from warmth. And you build up these requirements of what the user's stated objectives are. And that's your job as a designer. Your job isn't to build what they want. So I think you definitely talk to users. Users can only speak, and we're all like this, we can only speak in the language of solutions. No one goes to, into a restaurant and says, I have an abstract need for consuming some pescatarian-based uh, method or whatever. People will talk and say, I want fish. And you're like, OK, well, that's what you're saying you want. Let me make sure that that's actually what you really want. So I think understanding that customers, when they speak to you, what they're, they're, they're expressing the problem in the form of a solution. And it's your job to kind of work out what's the actual core need here. Otherwise, they'll build exactly what they want, which is a problem, because 
five different people will express their solution five different ways, and you have to build five different products, and that's a mess. Well, it's an interesting question because the, the Henry Ford quote that you talk about, I would have built a faster horse, when products are being developed, I think about Nest where we were an early investor with mm -hmm. Shasta and there were 10 people working out of a garage. And what they did when they were designing a new thermostat is they went out and they visited hundreds of homes and they took a look at where is the thermostat in the home, mm -hmm. how do people interact with it, what do they do? And they did that before they really started to put a solution together yeah. and figured out what would people want to do but there wasn't a lot of user testing, really, in the early days. And for a lot of companies, especially hardware companies, you have to actually build something and instantiate it and put it into a product that once you ship, you can't change the hardware components yeah. of it. I mean, that's the interesting difference between hardware and software, this idea that like, in hardware, you, ha you have to do exactly what they do, which is go visit people in their homes, learn basically what are their functional requirements of a thermostat, what are their social requirements of a thermostat, what are their emotional requirements of a thermostat, so like keep me alive, make my house look cool, make me feel safe, whatever the sort of the combination are. But you form this list of assumptions of like this is what people care about. In software, you then go and write code about it, and if you're wrong, you write more code. Uh, in hardware, you hard code these assumptions in the form of a product that then gets put on a shelf and sold. This is why I think hardware startups can be a lot more like a, like, you know, massive success or, or like disappear pretty quickly because the ability to iterate or pivot is just not there. You can't be like, hey, you know that thermostat? Well, it's now a fridge. You know, it, it doesn't work, right? You have to basically, you know, get it right. Well, one of the things that I think a lot about with products is the idea of storytelling yeah. and the arc that a product follows over time. And you have the initial product that comes out, and sometimes when you bring that initial product, you want it to be simple, because if you bring all the features and everything it would have, people wouldn't understand that core product. It almost takes away from it. Mm -hmm. And then you add these software features over time that either make the hardware better, or if it's a pure software product, it becomes more complex, but it becomes richer. How do you think about what are the things that you release day one, and the things that you might push out and release down the road? Like, there's two sides to that. So, like, <clears throat> I think from a user's point of view, whatever you release is whatever they consume. So, so the, the, the <laughs> kind of like, if, if, if I, if I buy, a, you know, if like Nest release like new features on day 60, and I buy on day 61, I'm probably getting all those features. So, like, so you you have like the the customer experience is kind of the paramount piece here. Um, I think the 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 way you have to think about that is there's like there's really two halves to this. One of them is like. When you're, like, you know, when you're spending your money and you have a certain amount of runway, what is the minimum viable product? What's version 1, 1.1, 2.1, whatever? And I think you know, from that point of view, it's like you have to start with something that, that actually solves the problem. And it can be solving the problem that you're obsessed with for a specific niche. And this is what's often called like the niche to win strategy or niche to win if you're from America. Um, but it's this idea of like, let's nail it for one specific use case for one specific type of user. And when we know we're onto the, in a good place, we can then say, right, do we want a second use case or a second user segment? And that's kind of how you iterate while getting market feedback. And is this what you did with Intercom when you were building Intercom as a co-founder? I, I guess it is, but it certainly wasn't the strategy at the time. Like, what we specifically did was we wanted to build a product for people like us. We had had a previous business where we had like tens of thousands of people using our product all over the world, and we'd never met a single customer. Uh, in fact, we were in Dublin, Ireland at the time, and there was a single street in San Francisco where we had more customers than we did in all of Ireland. So that, that was like how divorced we were from our actual users. And uh, we wanted to build that bridge. So, so we were building for our own, our, our own problems as we sort of tasted them. And it's really only in the past couple of years that, that we've uh, you know, had to sort of look further afield and be like, OK, moving outside of the world of what Intercom needs out of Intercom, what else do we need to do? And, and like, so that, for example, that means like integrating with software that we ourselves don't use, which is totally fine, because other people, some people use Salesforce, some people use HubSpot, some people use Marketo, some people use Pardot. We have to work with all of them. Uh, that's a, but that necessarily means we're no longer building for ourselves. So, uh, so I think. Like the, if the intercom pattern, if you like, would have been solve your own problem as well as you can for you, and hopefully you're not alone in this world. Uh, hopefully there are more businesses out there, and in our case, it turns out there's been at least 20,000 of them at this stage. So. so one of the things we were talking about is what hardware and software can learn from each other. 
And with hardware companies, we think a lot about the emotional component mm -hmm. because you touch the product, and when you touch something, you see it in a lot of ways, it evokes more of an emotional response, mm -hmm. hopefully positive, that you have because you'd like the people that use the product to become your advocates and mm -hmm. talk about it on social media and do that. One of the things I've seen with Intercom is you have this logo that, at least as mm -hmm. I read it, it looks like a microphone, mm -hmm. but it also looks like a happy face mm -hmm. in it. How do you think about branding for Intercom? Is that, was that part of the original product or was it something that layered in over time? Uh, it was very much there from the start. We, you know, Intercom's uh, you know, our mission in 2011, as it is today, was make internet business personal. And for something to be personal, you have to be able to see and talk. So the logo is a set of eyes and a mouth, and it's called Intercom, borrowing from the real world Intercom idea. And uh, we've really, really thought deeply about brand from the very start. Our CEO, Owen, has driven so much of this. But I think, you know... From the you, very early days. From, from day one. We're like, going to call this Intercom, and yeah. we want to have this emotional connection yeah. with our users. Yeah, well, we want to stand for this emotional... It's a, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't... I mean, yes, we wanted it, but we also wanted the brand to stand for the idea that you care about your customers. You can see them, you can talk to them, they can talk to you. And, um, and like, to use an example, so, like, I said earlier, and, and you touched on it, the idea of, like, there's like functional requirements for a product, there's social requirements for a product, and there's emotional. And, uh, and with Nest, for sure there's an emotional element, and for sure it actually has to detect smoke, but it also looks pretty cool on a wall. Um, one thing we think about a lot is we have to live inside our customers' products and say something that stands for something valuable, much like Nest stands for something valuable when it sits on the wall of an apartment. Um, so that, the, other, the other half of Intercom, the messengers that, that you see in the bottom right-hand corner, we want that to mean something. So when people log into a product, and we see this all the time, people log in and they say, shit, I, whenever I see the Intercom logo, I know that this business takes their shit seriously and they're going to look after me. And like, that's exactly what we've been trying to do from the very start, like basically saying that logo, that sense of we use Intercom should mean that like, we care about our customers. And that's, you know, we've been fighting for that for six years. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The other thing that I think people miss about a name is the name isn't necessarily about you. Mm -hmm. It's actually about your customers and their relationship mm -hmm. with the product. And you want to have a name that those customers feel good about. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea of an empty vessel mm -hmm. for naming where you have something that you can build around. Was there anything that happened with Intercom and the brand where the customers brought something to the brand that surprised you a bit? Um, <clears throat> I think on the, uh, like the, the naming point's interesting because when you're naming your company, you basically have this like spectrum of abstraction, right? And uh, on one side you have like, you know, you, we could have called Intercom, talk to your users and let them talk to you, dot com, right? <laughs> and, and that would have been a pretty limiting extreme name. And on the other side, we could have gone for something like incredibly vague, like talk. Right? And everyone's like, what the hell does talk do? Okay? So you have to kind of pick your point. And like, for Nest, it could have been detect smoke, or it could have been like inhale, or something like that. Right? <laughs> uh, so like, I think you know, we, we picked Intercom. And then I think what our users brought to it was this sense of pride that we didn't necessarily know that they'd experience, which is people like, you know, when we added this feature, which says like powered by Intercom, people were like, shit, I want to put that on. Because that means, you know, that means like that people will know. Like it almost it has almost become a badge of honor, and because of that, that's absolutely influenced the design of, of the messenger itself and the design of a lot of our user-facing components. This idea that like we need to like look great in their product and help them look great, because and like that was something that wasn't super obvious. I don't get to start. One of the things we were talking about a bit backstage is this idea of how do you measure how much your customers like you. Mm -hmm. And we talked briefly about Net Promoter Score. And yeah. for people that might not be familiar with NPS or Net Promoter Score, it's basically a measure of scale of 1 to 10. Would you recommend the product to a friend or not? Yeah. Yeah. And how do you think about that? Do you think that's a useful tool? Or do you think there are better tools for measuring engagement I, um, and love for a product? Yeah. Uh, the challenge with NPS is, I think, whatever, what happens is everyone installs NPS, or they do a survey, and, uh, and the manner in which they do the survey is never particularly thoughtful, but we'll come back to that in a second. Usually what happens is they sort of ask all the user base, would you recommend me to a friend? And they get this score back, which is you're like, 
your, I think your, your lovers minus your detractors, and you ignore the people in the middle, and that's your NPS score. And basically you're told if it's above 70, that's good. Uh, or I can't remember if the number is 70 or something else, but... 70 is good. Yeah, 70 yeah, is good, 70 right? Is and, good. And, and if it's below 50, it's very bad or whatever. And basically, you only ever hear people talk about their NPS score when it's good. Um, when it's, because when it's not good, they then have to go and say, well, shit, what do we do now? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but wouldn't it have been good to ask something more than this single point scale question? So I find it, it, like, it can be a positive sign or it can be a really ambiguous negative sign. And if it's an ambiguous negative sign, you then have to go and ask all these extra questions like, why wouldn't you recommend us? And it turns out at that point, you're into qualitative research. The, the snarky sort of argument within the design community will be like, why not just do that in the first place? Why are we, like, you know, it's like we want a metric unless it's bad, in which case we want fucking excuses, you know? Like, uh, so I think that's one challenge. The other piece of MPS I think people get wrong is they tend to like, you know, ask all of their users at the same time. Uh, so that means you're asking people who signed up yesterday, people who are paying you $5,000 a month. Yeah, you're just dive bombing them. Everyone's the same, right? Everybody. Everyone's the same. You've, you don't care about when, how much, what, who, when, why. Uh, and as a result, you aggregate all this and you get this kind of one size fits none sort of score for your user base and you just hope it's good. And it, it feels like a bit like a bit too weak for me for a way of actually measuring are we doing a good job building product. So. We do do NPS in Intercom, but it's, as, it, it's like one of many sort of uh, radars we have for picking up customer well, love. One thing I'd like to ask about is when you take a look at the emotional connection that your users build with Intercom, what are the few key tricks or tips that you have for people to build a positive emotional connection with a product? Between our customers and Intercom? I mean, we, we've done so much from a, like one thing we really like doing is creating real world experiences. And like, so if you sign up for Intercom, we'll send you like playing cards that have like strategies for different ways you should use Intercom. You'll get t-shirts, stickers, we release books, we have uh, live events, we just completed a world tour. We do all of this to try and strengthen this sort of emotional connection. And then on the product side of things, like we've always kind of obsessed over making our product as consumer feeling as possible. So the idea is that like messaging has killed every other form of communication, including obvious ones, like even in person, like people just, you know, how, how many times do you hang up a phone call and say, can you, and you, and you immediately write an iMessage saying, what's going on, what's up, like, let's talk, because for some reason we just hate talking in person. Messaging is so dominant, and one thing we've obsessed over is making it feel as natural to message a business as it is to message your friend. And that is actually what creates this sense of relationship that we've kind of been designing for. That emotional connection, and that's why we build... Is there anything you, know, you do around just like sounds it makes yeah, or the way this. the interactions so work? Like, or? It, it's hilarious, right? So we have customers who are like banks, we have customers who are like large utility providers, and we roll out features like stickers and GIFs and like, That's got to be interesting when you're working with a bank. Right, exactly. And like, no, really, uh, we want you to use stickers. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, we have let your customers and, and your support staff communicate through the power of GIFs and stickers and memes and all sorts of shit like this. And, uh, <laughs> and what's funny is the, initially the reaction is always the same. It's like, why aren't you working on version four of the Salesforce integration? Uh, to, you know, like, uh, please stop adding GIFs and all this other novel shit. Uh, we're a bank. And then two weeks later, give or take, they're like, actually, we like this thing. You know, it turns out our customers really like us now. We're having great relationships with them. And I'm like, exactly, because it's this idea of being that little bit more vulnerable and opening yourself that little bit, like, yeah, to be that little bit more personal with the customers. It, like, we have so many examples of people who are like, a conversation starts out angry and ends up ridiculously happy because, the, because it's humans on both sides. And actually, people don't like shouting at each other all the time. Like, most people aren't MMA fighters. They're actually just trying to get their job done, you know? Well, we've, we've got a little less than a minute here, but... Cool. One thing that I would say is having that positive emotional connection with your user is incredibly important and I think overlooked. And do you have any final tips for people, product I, people? I, I, I think the emotional connection has to match your brand. That's the first, as, as in like, you don't always want to like be like just lovey-dovey. Like, and and like a lot of people get this wrong when like they have error messages that are like, oops, we lost all your money or something like that, right? Like you have to kind of get the right tone of the emotion uh, to match whatever your brand stands for. And then secondly, like you then have to choose whatever your strengths are to deliver that. Would it that be like hardware, packaging, events, sounds, whatever? You should really just play to your strengths and play to your strongest emotions. 
Great. Well, with that, we need to wrap, but please join me in thanking Des for joining us today.